Oh, thank you, thank you. It is uh, a joy to finish out tonight with you. I can't believe the time has gone by as it has, but uh, we are very grateful and humble at the invitation. Terry and I feel like we have a lot of new friends now. We wish we could take you back or take your country back. It's as beautiful here. Uh, I, I need to say uh, a word of just appreciation watching the worship tonight. The entire worship team is just marvelous, just wonderful. But I was especially touched to see the young people a part of the worship team. I really, I really am blessed to see that with, with the three teenage guys over here, Jonathan on the keys and Matthew on the bass and Caleb on the drums and then Kayla up here singing that solo with Rachel, the artist. Wasn't all that wonderful tonight? Just give God praise for that. So what a blessing to see the next generation loving Jesus and being a part of the ministry here. So, so grateful. And, and Kayla's back there running my slides too. So thank you, Kayla, for doing a good job with my slides too tonight. Praise the Lord. Well, as Pastor Al said, um, our church is in uh, the suburbs of Washington, D.C., so uh, it is good to get away from Washington politics for a change and come here. Washington politics are a mess, ladies and gentlemen, and it reminds me of this joke, so I'll start with this. There was a Jewish rabbi and a Hindu priest and a Washington politician who all went on a hike together, and it was getting dark. And they got lost, and they couldn't find their way home. So they came across uh, a farmer and uh, a house where the farmer lived. And so they knocked on the door. They said, we're lost. It's dark. Can we have lodging for the night? The farmer said, well, I only have two beds. There are three of you. So two of you can have the two beds. The third guy has to go sleep in the barn. And so the... The Jewish rabbi said, all right, I'll be the first one to go sleep in the barn. And so the Hindu priest and the politician went to bed in the house. A few minutes later, there was a knock at the door. It was the Jewish rabbi. He said, there's a pig in the barn. That's not kosher for me. I can't sleep in the barn. The Hindu priest said, all right, I'll go sleep in the barn. And so a few minutes later, there's a knock at the door. It's the Hindu priest. He said, there's a cow in the barn. Cows, I can't be with cows. It's not right. And so finally, the Washington politician said, all right, fine. I'll go sleep in the barn. So he went off into the barn. A few minutes later, there's a knock at the door. They open the door. It's the cow and the pig. <laughs> it's the cow and the pig. Thank you. That one gets me in trouble when I tell that joke in Washington. Yeah, you're good here. It's good here, but there it gets me in trouble. Well, so good to see you again for this last session. Did anybody learn anything about sheep last night if you were here? All right. Did you learn a little bit more about Psalm 23 so far? A little bit? Well, we're going to look at the rest of Psalm 23, so take your Bibles, if you would, please, and let's look at Psalm 23 together. And, uh, and actually, if, if, if we have the verses, we might as well go and recite it together. Most people know this by heart. I'm reading from New King James. Um, do we, if we, yeah, there you go. Wonderful. So let's all just read this aloud and together. Ready? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we thank you that we can gather here together tonight. 
I thank you for all those who are here, those who are watching online. We just give you praise and glory for your word. We thank you that you are the good shepherd. You are the chief shepherd. You are the overseer of our souls. And so we pray that we would draw comfort from this 23rd Psalm. Many of us have heard it many times before, but Lord, speak in fresh ways to us tonight and glorify yourself. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, last night we looked at, uh, we got the background on sheep. We looked at just the first uh, three verses, uh, uh, partially into verse three. And uh, we talked about how David was a shepherd himself long before he was a king. So he writes the 23rd Psalm from firsthand experience. He knows what it is to be a shepherd. He knows what it is to take care of sheep. And he writes this as an analogy that we are like sheep and the Lord is our good shepherd. And this is a chapter that is intended to comfort us. This is a chapter that is intended to encourage us, to inspire us, to remind us that the Lord is looking out for us. In fact, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. We talked last night about how we need to understand he's a personal God. He's my shepherd. You might sometimes feel like you're just a number among seven and a half billion people on the planet. I'm telling you, you're more than a number because your Father in heaven knows you. He's acquainted with you. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes us lie down in green pastures. It's a statement about how we have contentment in him. And he, and he feeds us and he takes care of us. He leads us beside still waters. Remember I said last night how sheep will not drink from moving water. They're scared of it. But he, he gives us still waters. He, he, he keeps our fears at bay. He, he's the one who calms our fears and quiets our hearts. And then he restores our souls. He's the one who takes worn out people and refreshes us and makes us new in him. Well, as we look at the rest of verse 3 tonight, the rest of verse 3 says, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So circle or highlight if you have an electronic Bible, circle the word me first. It says, He leads me. In the paths of righteousness. Again, the, David makes this deeply personal. As, as we should read it. That he, he, he leads me in the paths of righteousness. Now typically a shepherd then and now. Even today in Israel. A shepherd will lead a whole flock together. But David departs from that norm. Which is typical. You would have a whole flock together. And he personalizes it. The shepherd leads me. In the paths of righteousness. And he again, he's emphasizing the individual care and attention that our good shepherd gives each of us. He, he leads me, and notice the word lead. You can circle that word too. A shepherd does not merely send the sheep off. The shepherd goes ahead of them. And he leads them. He leads them along specific paths that he has chosen. Because we said last night how sheep are senseless, they will intuitively go the direct line from point A to point B. And that can be sometimes dangerous because they don't really think about what is in between point A and point B. So if a shepherd, for example, is up high on a hill and he calls his sheep, they will make a straight line to where the, sh the, the shepherd is. And that means sometimes they won't avoid rocks and thorns and crevices and they'll fall in to crevices and they'll stumble into rocks because all they know is point A to point B. They're senseless creatures. We talked about this. But yet what David is saying here is our good shepherd, the Lord, he leads us. He helps us to navigate the path of life. He goes before us. So that he can direct us and guide us and help us along the way. David would also write in Psalm 27, 11, Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path. Now when he says that, a straight path, it literally in the Hebrew means a safe path. A safe path. A path that is unencumbered. A path that where I won't stumble. A path that is on level 
ground. This is how our good shepherd takes care of us. David also said in Psalm 143 verse 10, he said, teach me to do your will for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. And so this is our father. This is our good shepherd. Isaiah 26, 7 says the path of the righteous is level. O upright one, you make the way of the righteous smooth. And so this is the kind of thing that David is saying here in Psalm 23 about paths of righteousness. That our good shepherd goes before us. He leads us. He leads us on smooth level ground, paths of righteousness. And when we follow the Lord, you see, our good shepherd will lead us on a good path, on a level path, on a smooth path, on a right path. It won't be a harmful path. God is never going to lead you in a harmful way. It will not be a painful path. There are painful things that happen in this world. But God is not the one who is giving us the pain. Sometimes he uses the pain for his glory to help us, to teach us. But he leads us in places that are not regrettable, that are not harmful, that are not painful. Most of us end up on those paths because of our own choices. Because we're not usually following the Lord. The Bible says that the way of the wicked... Is, is hard. And sometimes when we do things apart from the Lord, we make our paths hard. Our road becomes full of debris and we stumble and there's danger along the road because of our choices along the way, but not our good shepherd. He leads us on paths of righteousness. And notice the rest of verse 3, for his name's sake, for his name's sake. I just want you to think about that for a moment. He acts on our behalf for his name's sake. Why is that important? Because God does not act on our behalf based on our character or reputation, but based on his. And here's why this matters. In other words, God's care for us is not dependent on how good we are, but on how good he is. He leads us on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So it's not because of anything good of us. It is everything good about God. He doesn't help us or heal us or provide for us or protect us or save us because we are those things, but because he is those things. He is our helper. He is our healer. He is our provider. He is our protector. He is our savior. And thus he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So we must follow God's lead. We must follow God's lead. You know, sometimes people get way ahead of God and then they want God to bless the direction that they're going. Like, why is God obligated to bless the direction that we decide to take in our own lives? We need to discern where, how he is leading and then follow him. He's the good shepherd who leads us. Otherwise, we end up on a miserable path, a miserable path of our own choosing. But God's path is a good path. It is a safe path. It is the right path for your life. This is why Jesus said in John 10, 27 and 28, he said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. They follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So this is our good shepherd. We have to follow the leading of the Lord. One of the most often asked questions I get as a pastor is, Pastor, I want to discern what the will of the Lord is. People want to know what the will of the Lord is. But not as many people who ask me, I want to know what the Lord's will is, are actually willing to do what the Lord's will is. Because most of us want to do what my will is. Okay, I hear you, God, but I want to do this. And then God's like in heaven going, okay, fine, let's see how that works out for you. You know? But we need to discern what is God's will. And, and the best way you can discern the will of God is through the word of God. Get into the word of God. Read his word. It is amazing how God will speak to you through some verse you've read a million times. But because you have fresh eyes and an open heart, Lord, guide me, lead me, show me. Then there are different verses that will pop off the page and give you inspiration and direction. He is our good shepherd who leads us in paths of righteousness. Now look at verse 4. The first part of verse 4. 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Now, this verse is about fear, and it's about God's comfort in response to our fear. Remember that one of our bullet points last night about sheep is that they are by nature fearful. They can see color and are frightened by bright colors, especially yellow. They have exceptional hearing, so they're frightened by noises. We also mention how they walk in a zigzag line. They don't walk in a straight line because they're always looking over their shoulders, seeing if there's any predator behind them. And they are defenseless. That's why they're always, you know, paranoid about where the predators are. They are even afraid of moving water. We talked about this. So when, we, when you consider how fearful sheep are, this verse here is addressing the natural fears that we as sheep sometimes have. It is normal, but not healthy for us to have fears from time to time. And God wants to help us with our fears. Fears are not of the Lord. You know, the Bible says that perfect love drives out fear. And the Bible says that God is love. So guess what? He wouldn't drive out himself. He's not the author of fear. The enemy is the author of fear. Either that or our own flesh gives way to fearful thoughts because we're not willing to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Fear is a normal part of life, but it's not a healthy part of life. And we have to give our fears to the Lord. Well, David is reminding us here that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. One of the biggest fears that sheep, literal sheep have, not talking figuratively about us for the moment, literal sheep, the biggest fear they have is becoming cast, C-A-S-T. Now, here's what a cast sheep is. It's when they lie on their side and they roll a little bit too much. And their legs are sticking up in the air. They can't get back on their feet. So sheep have a fear of being cast. That's what it's called. Now listen to this. If, 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 if they become cast, they could actually die in a few hours. Philip Keller, in his book, I referenced it the other night. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Listen to what Philip Keller wrote. A heavy fat or long fleeced sheep will lie down comfortably in some little hollow or depression in the ground. It may roll on its side slightly to stretch out or relax. And suddenly the center of gravity in the body shifts so that it turns on its back far enough that the feet no longer touch the ground. It may feel a sense of panic. And start to paw frantically. I want you to picture this. Are you picturing this in your mind? There, the little helpless sheep is on its back. Pawing frantically. Which only makes it worse. It rolls over even further. Now it is quite impossible for it to regain its feet. And as it lies there struggling. Gases begin to build up in the rumen. Sheep have four chambers in their stomach. Gases build up in their stomach. And as the gases expand. They tend to cut off blood circulation to the extremities of the body, especially the legs. And if the weather is very hot and sunny, a cast sheep can die in a few hours, end quote. So they're very afraid of a lot of things. And maybe this is why this particular psalm has become so popular at funerals, because it talks about this death, the valley of the shadow of death. But this reference to the valley of the shadow of death really doesn't refer to death itself. It's talking about a, about a real place. There, there is actually a valley in Israel along the road from Jericho to Jerusalem. And it is referred to as the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because Jews would make common pilgrimage up to Jerusalem. And this particular valley was a place where thieves and bandits would hide. And as people were making pilgrimage up to Jerusalem, the thieves and the bandits would be perched there along the valley and they would rob people. They would assault people. They would steal from people. So it was a very dangerous passage between Jericho and Jerusalem. It is actually believed that the story of the Good Samaritan happened right there. In fact, when you go to Israel, the, on the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, there's a marker which talks about that story 
which is believed to have happened along that way. Remember how this guy gets mugged. He gets uh, robbed. He gets beaten and left for dead along the side of the road. It's only a Samaritan who comes along and ministers to him and, and binds up his wounds and takes care of him. And so Jesus uses that parable to commend a Samaritan who took care of this guy who got robbed and beaten along the road. It is believed that that parable, that story took place in that area known as the valley of the shadow of death. And there are many fears that people can have. There are over 500 documented phobias. Did you know that? Besides kind of the more common ones like acrophobia, the fear of heights, or claustrophobia, the fear of being closed in tight spaces. Over 500 documented types of fears. And maybe you struggle with a certain kind of a fear. And I want you to know that you have a good shepherd who wants to help you with your fears. There are valleys of fear that all of us from time to time will struggle with. Perhaps you're going through one right now. But the Lord is our good shepherd to help us. If you notice the rest of verse 4, After he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now notice that. Because what he says here is that the greatest comfort to fearful sheep is knowing that their shepherd is nearby. Their shepherd is nearby. And David says here, the greatest comfort to you and me In the valley of fear is knowing that the Lord is with us. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, So do not not fear, for I am with you. And do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I want you to notice something important at this point that gets missed in Psalm 23. It's at this point, right here in the middle of verse 4. That the pronoun for God changes from he to you. Notice this in your Bibles. Verse verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But now notice notice verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you. Are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It shifts right there in verse 4 from he in the third person to you in a very personal way here. There is something about knowing God's presence. In the midst of fearful times that moves the relationship from he to you. It becomes very personal here. When you experience God's abiding presence in your life during times when you are in the valley. It makes the relationship that much more real and personal. Just like it did for David. Listen, David experienced different valleys. He was no different from you and me. David experienced the valley of fear. He was 10 years on the run for his life because King Saul was trying to kill him. 10 years that man fled and ran from Saul, this murderous, demonized king who kept trying to kill David. And why? Because Saul was insecure and jealous of the fame that David had. For killing Goliath and for leading the Israeli army, his little ragtag group of soldiers, to have victory over the Philistines. And Saul became jealous and he became bitter and he became envious and he wanted to kill one of his own. And he hunted David like an animal. And David would spend much of those 10 years down by the Dead Sea, hiding in caves and writing many of the Psalms too, by the way. God would speak to David's heart. In the middle of the valley of fear because God was preparing David to be a king. And David needed to go through that valley of fear in order to know that God was with him. It would develop in David a greater dependence on God. 
Sometimes that fear you're going through, God wants to use it to draw you near to Him. So that when you find your dependence on Him and your wholeness in Him and your comfort in Him and your peace in Him, you're stronger for it. You're closer to Him because of it. This is where David would write, as a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you, the living God. He was down in the desert when he wrote that. He was hiding from King Saul. There's very scarce fresh water down in the desert by the Dead Sea. But he found an oasis at En Gedi, a spring in the middle of the desert down there where he would write as a deer pants for water. So my soul longs after you, Lord. And so David experienced the valley of fear. He knows what it is. David also experienced the valley of rejection. There is an often missed verse in the Bible that gives us insight into David's family life growing up. It's Psalm 27.10. David wrote this, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. It's just a passing verse, but it says a lot. Though my father and mother forsake me. Something was going on in David's family where his father and mother had forsaken him. They were not as loving towards him as he probably wanted. And so he says, well, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. The Lord loves me. You have to remember, remember that when Samuel the prophet came to the home of Jesse to anoint the next king of Israel. Jesse had eight sons. How many sons did he parade in front of Samuel? Seven. The eighth son was still in the field because Jesse the father did not even think enough about David to bring him to the lineup. How rejecting is that? It wasn't until Samuel looked at every single one of Jesse's sons and said, nope, 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 nope. We're going to sit here until you find someone else because these boys aren't the one. And Jesse said, well, yeah, I got this other little punk kid out in the field watching sheep. And Samuel's like, that's the one. Go get him. How rejecting that David was not even a part of the lineup before the prophet Samuel. So David understood the valley of rejection. If you've come from a family where a mom or dad did not really love you or abandoned you or rejected you, maybe you don't even know who a, who a dad is, you still have a father in heaven who loves you, who loves you as a good shepherd, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. David understood what he's writing about here. He also experienced the valley of sin when he committed adultery. And had Bathsheba's husband killed to cover up his sin with her. But every time David hit a valley, whether it was a valley of fear, a valley of rejection, or a valley of sin, God met him there. God met him there. And God will meet you too. That's why David says here also in verse 4, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, the rod of the shepherd was a weapon to protect the sheep from predators. So the rod was used to defend the sheep. God is our defender. The staff, the staff is what we, we, we see in pictures and drawings of a shepherd's staff with the crook at the top and the long staff. The shepherd's staff was used to rescue the sheep. When they would fall into a ravine, the shepherd would take the crooked end of the, of the staff to be able to pull out the sheep, to rescue the sheep. And so David is giving us this picture. The rod is a picture of God defending me. He's my good shepherd. He's going to defend me. The staff is a picture of God rescuing me. When I fall down, my father in heaven will rescue me. He comes after me like a good shepherd would rescue his sheep. And then verse 5, in your Bibles, verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, this does not mean that God is going to make you eat dinner with people that you don't like. I, I used to read that verse and think, I guess in heaven, I guess in heaven, you know, people you, you didn't necessarily like on earth, but they made it to heaven too, you know. Because they love Jesus, like you love Jesus, but you never got along. And God's going to make you sit down in heaven and have dinner with the people who are enemies on earth. 
And I was like, that's not going to be a good dinner. If I have to look across the table at somebody I didn't like, well, okay. That's a real small way of thinking about heaven. I mean, once we're in the glorious presence of Jesus, we're all going to love each other, even if we don't necessarily love each other now. We're going to have a love for each other then. But listen, that's not what that verse means. That's not what that verse means. Although Proverbs 16, 7 does say, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Okay? But we have to read this verse through the eyes of a shepherd. The word table, the word table, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The word table is not a reference to what we think like a dinner table. Like a, a table of wood with legs and we sit down and we eat at a dinner table. A table in this context in the Hebrew means a plateau. It means a plateau. The flat plateaus of the hill country where sheep graze. That's a table. So don't think of a dinner table or a dining room table. This is a reference to the flat plateaus in the hill country where sheep would normally graze. Again, quoting from Philip Keller, he said, quote, In some of the finest sheep country of the world, especially in the western United States and southern Europe, the high plateau of the sheep ranges were always referred to as mesas, the Spanish term for tables, a mesa. And so the scene that David is describing here is a green, flat plateau where sheep could graze without fear of their enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is a wonderful, you have to picture, instead of a wooden table to eat dinner at, you have to picture a green, flat plateau, an open field where sheep would graze. But listen, all the time where sheep would graze, there are predators all around. Those are the enemies, the wolves. The coyotes, the lions, those are all the enemies of the sheep. And, the, and those enemies know where the sheep graze. And so they're perched along the sides of the ravines where these sheep are grazing. And this is what David is writing about, though. He's saying, but you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, but you protect me from them so that I can graze freely here. You know this, listen to this stat. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the United States, predators, again, we're talking about wolves, lions, coyotes, those kind of things. Predators accounted for 31% of all sheep and lamb deaths in the United States, costing farmers and ranchers over $20 million a year. They have to constantly be guarding their flocks because these natural predators will come and attack the sheep and farmers lose in the United States $20 million a year because of the predators that attack. So understand, when David says here, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, he is describing sheep who graze in peace on the plateaus, even though they are in the presence of their enemies, coyotes and lions perched on the ridgetop, because their shepherd is looking out for them and will not allow them to be harmed. Now consider this analogy because the Bible describes our enemy, Satan, like a roaring lion looking for someone to, to devour. So here we are, the sheep, and our enemy is like a roaring lion. He's a predator, but, and he's perched on the ridge lines, and he's looking for some opportune time to pounce on the sheep because he wants Satan, the, the lion, the roaring lion, he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your churches. He wants to destroy your families. But our God is the good shepherd who will keep us from all harm. Amen? Amen. He's the good shepherd who will keep us from all harm. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. You see, even though our enemy is real, and even though he seeks our destruction, the Lord prepares our table and he allows us to be at peace and at rest without fear of harm. Because though our enemy is always on the prowl, our strong shepherd will watch out for his sheep. Psalm 121, 7 to 8. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. 
The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. The other half of verse 5 in your Bibles, you anoint my head with oil. You anoint my head with oil. Now, in the Old Testament, they would anoint the head of a priest. They would take olive oil. They would anoint the head of a priest, and that would mean that they had God's blessing and spirit for a design and specific purpose. That's not, though, the particular reference in this case. Two of the things that tormented sheep, we talked about this a little bit last night, were flies and parasites. The flies and the parasites would burrow into their ears. They would climb up the noses of the sheep. It was very tormenting. I mentioned to you last night that sheep can be so tormented by the flies and the insects that burrow in their ears and through their nose that they would often, to, to try to get relief, they would ram their heads against a tree or a rock and they would often kill themselves doing that. Not intentionally, but they would end up dying because they're under such attack. And so shepherds would use olive oil to pour in the ears and up the nose and over the head of the sheep because the olive oil was a deterrent to the flies and the, and the insects. So per, they, they would anoint the head of the sheep with oil to protect the sheep from all of the tormenting insects and parasites. This is a beautiful picture of what the Lord does here. Shepherds would use olive oil. The Hebrew is shemen for oil as a protective agent against the flies and the parasites. Rubbing the oil into their ears, around their eyes, and in their noses. They would saturate their woolly little heads with oil. And it would give them relief. And it would bring them peace. See, the main purpose for anointing a sheep's head with oil was to relieve the sheep of suffering. To bring them comfort. And interestingly, of course, oil is a symbol in the Bible of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is called in John 14, 15, and 16, the counselor or the comforter. The shepherd saturates the sheep's head with oil for comfort and relief. This is what the Lord, the good shepherd, does for us. He brings comfort and, rel and relief to hurting souls. If you're here hurting tonight, I just want you to know your good shepherd wants to bring relief and comfort to you. If you've been tormented and you're in agony from something, the good shepherd wants to anoint your head with oil, so to speak, to bring comfort and peace to you who are suffering. Isaiah 53, 4, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The last part of verse 5, he says, my cup runs over. Something that overflows, something that runs over, is indicative of abundance or excess. It's having more than enough. And I know that sometimes you can probably feel like your cup is empty. I get that, depending on the toll that life might be taking. But God is the one who fills our lives to overflowing. Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jude verse 2, may peace and love be yours in abundance. God is the God of abundance, spiritually, emotionally, physically. He will take care of us in an abundant way. And then finally, verse 6. First part of verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David wants us to see our shepherd as he does, as good and merciful. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Isaiah 30 verse 18 says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. Now what's important to understand in this verse, circle of words are underlined, follow me. Because he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The words follow me in the Hebrew original language is a military term. And it literally means pursue me. His goodness and mercy shall pursue me. It's a military term. I want you to think about if you're, if you're fighting in a battle and you're pursuing, you're pursuing you're taking the offensive, and God here is pursuing us. And what is he pursuing us with? His goodness and his mercy. He relentlessly pursues us, and when we run from him, he runs even harder. 
to shower upon us his goodness and his mercy that we would turn to him and receive his forgiveness and his love as well. His goodness and mercy pursues me all the days of my life. And then lastly, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, sometimes in Scripture, the house of the Lord is a reference to church or to the temple of the Lord. And sometimes we'll use that expression, welcome to the house of the Lord. And it is. Church or, you know, the temple in Jerusalem was also known as the house of the Lord. But David is not talking about a physical building here. He's talking about heaven. And how do we know that? Because David has no illusions that somehow he's going to live forever in the temple in Jerusalem. He he understands, you know, I mean, it isn't even built until his son Solomon builds it. But he understands, like, he's not asking to live forever on earth in some earthly temple. He's talking about life after death and living in the house of the Lord forever in heaven. You see, Hebrews 8 tells us that there is a sanctuary of the temple that was in Jerusalem, which was a copy or a shadow of the temple that is in heaven, Hebrews 8, verse 5. In other words, there was an earthly temple, and there's a heavenly one. The earthly one that was in Jerusalem was a small replica of what was really in heaven, that there is a house of God, there is a temple in heaven, and this is really what David is saying here, how a good and merciful God pursues us because he wants a relationship with us so that through faith in Jesus Christ, we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is our good shepherd. And this is why Jesus said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's what he did for us. He laid down his life for us so that through faith in Jesus Christ, we might know personally our good shepherd. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the heart of David who understood what it is to be a shepherd. He understood about sheep and he would write that so that we would understand you are our good shepherd, Lord. We are like the sheep. And we thank you that you comfort us and you provide for us and you protect us and you guide us, you lead us, you rescue us. You anoint our head with oil because you want to bring comfort to our suffering. You, you want to relieve us of our fears and our worries. And Lord, so that ultimately we can get through this life being held by your hand until one day we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so thank you, Lord, that you're our good shepherd here. And that one day, because of what Jesus did to lay down his life for us, we can be with you forever in the house of the Lord. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me, shall pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Lord, I pray you would bring comfort to those who need comfort tonight. I pray that you would bring healing to those who need healing. Lord, especially in regards to fear, where there is fear in their hearts. Lord, bring your peace. Where there is worry or anxiety, Lord, bring your comfort. And we thank you, Lord, that we can turn to you, that you can rescue us and help us and defend us as our good shepherd. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen.